Hello everyone, welcome to this new playlist. I'll be recording some lectures on the EPP calculus course. So this will help you in understanding the basics of function and all the general mathematical applications that are needed to study the EPP calculus course, okay, both AB and BC. I plan to upload those lecture series as well in the future, but first let us complete these. So let me give you an idea about how the pre-calculus exam is conducted. Okay, the pre-calculus exam is conducted in two sections. So section one consists of two parts and section two also consists of two parts. So there will be a small break between the parts and then there will be a large break between these two sections. By large, I mean 10, 15 minutes, okay? Do not expect a one hour break. All right, so section one is of two hours and section two is of one hour, all right? So these two hours, 120 minutes is divided into 80 and 40. So in the first part, 80 minutes, you have 28 MCQ questions, four options, one correct, no calculators are allowed. In the second part, 40 minutes, you have 12 questions, again, MCQ based, four options, one correct, calculators are allowed here. Calculators are allowed, doesn't mean that calculators will be required for every question. It is just allowed, you can use it if you need. In section two, you will have to spend one hour Part one is of 30 minutes, part two is of 30 minutes. In part one, there are two questions, both subjective. They are called FRQs, right? Free response questions. And calculators are allowed to be used. In part two, there are two questions, but no calculator. You can expect these to be comprehension type questions with multiple subparts. And each of the subparts will have either a question related to the main body of the question or something completely separate. So this is the structure of the exam. All right, now we move on to the first chapter. The first chapter is basically based on introduction to functions, right? So we'll first learn about sets a bit, and then we will move on to functions. Now, while starting this course, it is assumed that you know what the basics of function are. We will just define the terms and give you certain theoretical limitations or definitions of those terms and where you can apply them according to the logic, all right? So sets, what is set? A set is a well-defined collection of objects. Now, there are two important words here. First one is well-defined and the other one is objects. So well-defined means there has to be a rule governing it, all right? It can be mathematical, it could be logical. Now, for a well-defined set to exist, the set should be able to be defined by anyone just by looking at the rule. So for example, if I ask, what are some of the best movies that you have watched? I will prepare a list, you will prepare a list. Both of the lists will be different, okay? So this is not a well-defined list. But if I ask you about all the movies that IMDb has rated nine plus released in 2025, both of us will come up with the same list because I have fixed the parameters, all right? So as long as I have a well-defined structure, logical structure, I can get a set of objects, mainly numbers in our case, but of any object that is so-called universal, right? Your definition and my definition will be the same, okay? So I hope you understand what well-defined means. And a set, you can have a set of objects, right? A set of cutlery, a set of crockery is, is an, is a set that has multiple pieces and those are not numbers, so those are objects. But for our course of study, we will concentrate on numbers, no need for cutlery and stuff, okay? So just numbers, but know that a set can also be made of logical constraints, like alphabets, like A, B, C, D, E, F, E. As soon as I tell you what one alphabet is, you will know the next one. So that means it is well-defined for everyone. The set of 26 alphabets is well-defined, but there is no mathematical rule to that, all right? Here we will concern ourselves only with mathematical rules and numbers, okay? Sometimes variables, well, variables are numbers disguised as letters, right? So rules based and numbers. Now a function, a function is defined from one set to the other. So a function is defined from X to Y. X is known as the domain. So domain is basically the set where the function picks its values from or where we choose the values from to input into a function. Think of a function as a machine. It takes values from the domain and throws them out as Y. Y is known as the range, okay? Now all the values that I input in the domain should give an output. So that output, if collected in a different set, will be known as range. Now if I want, I can keep some extra values in range just because I want to. If I keep extra values in range that may not be obtained from the domain, then this range will have a different name. It will be known as a codomain, all right? So a function can be defined from domain to range or domain to codomain, all right? A few examples, uh, very common one, sin x. Sin x takes all values, so its domain is all real numbers. And its range is minus one to one because the minimum value of sin x is minus one and its maximum value is plus one. So all the values that you input will give you outputs that are between minus one to one, okay? So is cos x. But tan x is a bit different, okay? So for tan x, you cannot input pi by two, right? Because tan x is given by sin x by cos x and cos pi by two is zero, so you cannot divide by zero. So you cannot input pi by two. You cannot similarly input minus pi by two, three pi by two, minus three pi by two, five pi by two, minus pi. You can see where I'm going with this. So any odd multiple of pi by two, we cannot input. So the domain will basically be r minus two n plus one pi by two and n's are integers. So any odd multiple of pi by two, we will remove from the domain because the function does not exist there, okay? Or it has a vertical asymptote. We will learn about vertical asymptotes later. So the range of this function is r, okay? Because tan will give you any value. All right, now when we write a function in a variable form, then this y, so y is equal to fx, this y becomes a dependent variable, okay? And the value that we input becomes the independent variable. Now, a word of caution, do not remember independent and dependent variables by names, okay? So y equal to fx, in this particular context, x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. If I write x equal to fy, then x will become the dependent variable and y will become the independent variable, okay? So do not imprint in yourself that y is always the dependent variable and x is always the independent variable, okay? It depends on the definition of the function. Next, so a bit of diagrammatic representation. So a function f takes values from the domain to the range. Now, I, I told you, right, that if you keep some extra values, then this entire set will be called the codomain. If I remove the extra values, then a function can go from the domain to the range, all right? Therefore, a range of a function will always be a subset of its codomain. It could be equal, but it could be lesser as well. So if the codomain contains some extra values, then the range will be smaller because those extra values should not be there, okay? So the definition of a function is given by 
this a simple statement a function associates every element in the domain to a unique element in the codomain that's it enough all right now there are a few sums associated with the basics of functions i have given an example here so the us 2011 federal income tax for a single person this is the tax lab given all right so a function like this is known as a piecewise function all right piecewise because it is defined in pieces all right so what is the question uh, find the income tax for a person whose income was 20000 usd so where does 20000 fall in this category right so you would do 0.15 into 20000 minus 2575 sorry minus 425 and that should give you 2575 because 0.15 gives you 3000 usd and if you subtract 425 you will get this all right so if you want to try these sums on your own try them you can cover up the answer and check if your answer matches okay so this one will give you 6125 uh, which is for 40000 right 40000 will lie in this lab so 0.25 will give you a certain value and then you can subtract 3875 from it you should get the correct answer okay all right now we look into this definition suppose f and g are functions whose domain is the set consisting of the two numbers 1 comma 2 okay so these are the two inputs with f and g defined on this domain by the formula f x equal to x square and g x equal to 3x minus 2 so what is f1 so f1 will be 1 here and 3 into 1 1 here g g will also be 1 f2 will be 4 and this will also be 4 so are f and g equal no or yes think So two functions are equal if their output is the same for all elements in the domain of both functions. These are equal functions. Do they look equal? No. All right. So do not check the equality of functions based on how they are defined. You can check the equality of functions on the basis of their domains and ranges only. So check if their domains are equal and check if all the outputs from the domains, that is their ranges, are equal. If that happens, then on that domain those functions are equal. Okay. They do not have to be defined equal. They do not have to look equal. It only matters whether they give the same value as outputs or not. All right. These are equal. Okay. Now. A few domains of common functions for every polynomial. The domain is all real numbers. Sin x cos x we already discussed. For log x the domain is R plus. Okay, that means real numbers greater than zero. For e to the power x the domain is all R. For modulus x the domain is all R. And for one by x the domain is R apart from zero. Because again you cannot divide by zero. Now this one by x is quite important because this produces a very different sort of graph. Okay, so this is the graph of y equal to one by x. This can also be written in your exam as x y is equal to one. And this is known as a rectangular hyperbola. All right. So you will learn more about these in conic sections when you learn that in detail. Probably in early college mathematics. So rectangular hyperbola. Remember the shape. This is very common. Okay. Now we look into vertical asymptotes. All right. So a very simple way to calculate vertical asymptotes: set the denominator to zero and find the value of x. Okay. Of course, uh, to reduce the amount of calculations, do this after reducing the entire rational function into lowest terms. Now every function did not have a vertical asymptote. Right. So f x is equal to e power x does not have a vertical asymptote. There is no denominator. But f x is equal to e power x by x that has a vertical asymptote at zero. All right. So if the function has a denominator, then you can set that to zero and check. If the function does not have a denominator, do not need. There is no need to force one upon it. The function may not have a vertical asymptote. Okay. So for this function one by x. x equal to zero. That is the y-axis serves as a vertical asymptote, right? So it does not ever touch the y-axis. An asymptote is a line that the function tends towards but never touches. Okay, a bit of a sad story there. All right. So a few e examples. Which of the following functions has no vertical asymptotes? So for the first one, I can clearly see that if I cancel x minus seven, x minus five will be the vertical asymptote, right? Vertical asymptote x equal to five. The second one will also get factorized, right? This is a, a prime candidate for middle term factorization. So if you factorize this, you will get a value that should give you a vertical asymptote. In the second one, you will again have a vertical asymptote again. That will be x equal to two. In the last option D, both of these will cancel out, and you will end up with f x is equal to one. Okay, so this is the numerator is x minus four into x minus five. All right, so everything will cancel out, and you will have no vertical asymptote. So that does not make option D the correct answer anyway. All right, so more examples. If h d is defined as this function, then how would you? What is the domain of this function? So for a function to exist, you just need to remove all the points where it is not available. Right, so Remove all the points of vertical discontinuity or vertical asymptotes. So this is divided by t minus four, right? So just remove four, and you should get your answer. So if they want this in a set format, you can write minus infinity to four union four comma infinity. We'll not close the brackets here because we are not going to include four because four is the problem area, right? Next problem: g x is equal to square root over mod x minus y. Now this entire thing under square root has to be positive, right? Because for now, let us assume that we do not know complex numbers, and we can only calculate the square root of positive numbers. Okay? So this entire thing has to be greater than equals to zero. Which should give us mod x is greater than equals to five. Mod is greater than equals to five means either x less than equals to minus five or x greater than equals to five. So that is what is given here in the interval format. But here five is included because you can calculate the square root of zero and that will just turn out to be zero. But you cannot calculate the square root of let's say minus three hundred or something like that. Okay, so this has to be greater than equals to zero. Again, one more question on domain: root over x minus one and x square minus nine. What is the domain? So here there are two restrictions: the denominator cannot be zero, and this portion under square root cannot be less than zero. So we have to find the common interval in both of these restrictions. So x square minus nine not equals to zero means x is not equals to plus minus three because both three and minus three will give you nine here. That is a problem. And x is greater than equals to one. So figure out which intervals. If it is greater than equals to one, this minus three here doesn't matter because that will not be used anyway. We have to find x such that it is greater than equals to one. So we'll have one to three, and we will exclude three because at three we have a problem here. So three excluded. Then start from three and go to infinity. So this is the answer. More problems. Suppose the domain of G is in the interval one to twenty, with G defined as mod x minus five. Is two in the range? So how will we figure out if two is in the range or not? So we are Given mod x minus five is equal to two, so solve it. 
I, I get x is equal to 3 or 7. If x is 3 or 7 and the domain is 1 comma 20, then both 3 and 7 come from 1 to 20, right? So therefore 2 is in range. Alright? Few more sums. Describe the function f whose domain consists of 3 numbers, 2, 7, 13, and the function and the values are given by the following table. So in this table, these x values are the independent variables and these are the dependent variables. Again, be very careful if this was y and this was y, it y would have been the independent variable. You cannot decide dependent and independent variables based on name. It has to be based on the function. All right? So be very careful. I'm stressing this point again. All right, so how do you define the function? Just take f2 is equal to 3, f7 is equal to root 2, f13. You do not have to give the algebraic value of the function. All right? Okay, now when you are selecting domains and ranges, be very careful, you should not repeat any values. All right? If you have multiple values in the domain, then it's a problem anyway, because many to ones are not functions. So you should have, uh, going back to the definition of the function, the definition of the function said unique, something about unique, right? A function assists every element in the domain to a unique element in the codomain. So you cannot have repeated elements in the domain anyway, but you cannot also have repeated elements in the range. All right, so if there are repeated elements in the range, write them only once. Okay, so domain will be one, two, three, five, and the range will be six, comma, minus seven. Find the domains of the following functions. Use okay. Of course, we'll use correct notation. So first one, one by root over of x minus four. So this part should be non-zero, right? So x is not equal to plus minus two. That's it. One more thing. This should also be greater than zero. Okay. So this greater than zero means x is mod x is greater than equals to two. So I think uh, here I made a mistake while calculating because this should not be greater than equals to zero. Oh yeah, fine, fine. That is not a problem because I have taken the not equals to condition here. So technically, I could have combined both of these and written greater than zero. That would have been fine. But I've done it in two separate places so that you can understand how we can split the conditions. All right, the next one. Uh, I don't think I've done the next one. You can take that as a homework. So just make sure that this denominator is not zero. All right. C looked complicated. For C, you can middle term factorize this. You will get x minus one into x plus six, and this has to be greater than equals to zero. So draw a sign diagram. The roots here are one and minus six. So one and minus six. Try zero. So zero will give you zero minus one, zero plus six, negative. So here you will have positive, here you will have positive. So that means which are the positive regions? So from one to infinity and from minus infinity to six. You can include both of these as we can calculate square roots of zero. Okay, so minus infinity to six, union, one to infinity. One of the last few topics are odd and even functions. Now odd and even functions are very easy to figure out. You just have to look into how the functions behave. So odd functions, if you input a negative number, the negative number will be thrown outside. For even functions, if you include something negative, the negative will be absorbed. Alright, so for odd functions, f of minus x, okay, I think my case one is blocking the exam, example. So f of minus x is equal to minus fx, and for even functions, f of minus x is equal to fx. Okay, next, some example problems. Determine algebraically if each of the following functions are odd, even, or neither. So, just, just a hint, if there are constants that are not multiplied with variables, it will be neither odd nor even. Because f of minus x will become minus fx, odd fx, that will happen. But the constants will remain constant, right? So here you have a constant, therefore, you can show it because they want you to show this if it was a subjective problem, but in your head you should know that if this constant is like unattached, then you will always have the answer as neither. Okay, if there are no powers to it or something like this. Next, uh, this is minus six into fifth root of six x. So if I just write g of minus x, right? So g of minus x is, okay, I can take these constants together, six, fifth root of six, I took outside. So this is basically a constant into x to the power one fifth, right? x to the power one fifth is basically uh, fifth root of x. Okay, so I've written this in a better exponential format. All right, so this is minus c into minus x to the power one by five, and this is an odd power, so this minus will go outside, and we'll get cx to the power one fifth, which is the same as minus of gx. So this minus becomes plus, therefore this is an odd function, all right, because this minus comes outside, and you get a minus here, and it changes the sign. The next one, h of j is equal to j minus one. Again, a constant, right, an un unattached constant. This constant will make sure that it is neither. Okay, all right, now one more point that we have to study, probably the last one. This is known as the average rate of change. All right? You will learn more about this when we study differentiability in AP calculus. But for this chapter, just remember the formula. Average rate of change for any function is given as FB minus FA by B minus A. Now these points will be given to you. So find the average rate of change either in this interval or between these two points. So if they ask you to find the average rate of change in this interval, you put the later value as B and the earlier value as A, it wouldn't matter even if you switch them around, okay? <laughs> because it's a symmetric function. All right? So FB minus FA by B minus A, you should get the answer. So we have an example, x square between one to three. You put F3 minus F1 by three minus one, F3 is nine, F1 is one, three minus one, answer is four. Okay, uh, yeah, answer is four, fine. So this is how we evaluate average rate of change and some sums relating to average rate of change. So this is also known as a difference quotient. Okay, so same thing. For the following functions, find the average rate of change based on the linear interval. Be sure to show the difference quotient. Difference quotient is basically this one. They want you to show this step. All right. So first write this, then this answer. Do not write the answer directly, as the examiners will think you might have cheated. All right. So 3x minus 2 is between 2 to 3. So f3 minus f2 by 3 minus 2. f3 will be 9 minus 2, 7. f2 will be uh, 6 minus 2, 4. 3 minus 2 is 1. So 3 answer. 1 minus 3x square between minus 2 to 0. So f0 minus f of minus 2 divided by zero minus minus two. Be very careful with the negative signs here, okay? They will try to put all of these negatives here so as to confuse you, but your job is to not get confused, all right? So F zero is just one, and F of minus two is, uh, this is minus, right? So one minus, this is uh, two square four, one minus 12 is minus 11, so one minus minus 11 by two six, okay? So this was the last topic in this particular chapter. This is the entirety of the first module chapter of 
KP pre calculus done. We have divided the syllabus into around 19 or 20 modules. So I'll be uploading them one by one. These videos will be a bit longer. So just make sure you play them at 1.5x or 2x if it is needed. Okay. I hope this lecture helped. And if you have any questions or if you want more exercise problems, do mention them in the comments. I'll try to upload them as a Dropbox folder. Okay. Bye. Take care, and I'll see you all on the next one.